Good morning. Welcome to virtual worship here at Wellesley Village Church here on 2 Central Street here right in Wellesley Square and wherever you are as we gather in this virtual format becoming the church wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, open to the possibilities, open to the questions, open to the newness moving among us, affirming of the image of God that has come to rest in each and every one of us. Whoever you are, however you worship, wherever you seek God, whatever path you've taken, whoever you love, you are welcome here. You bear the image of God, you matter to God, and you matter to us. You are us. We are church only together, only with you. And so your presence here this morning is a gift. Welcome. I want to welcome you into worship this morning by inviting you into meditation. This morning, I want to share with you a brief reading from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever and ever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Redeemed. That's a big word, but I think it's quite simple. Let those who God has called, those who God has claimed as God's own, those who have heard that truth, that all of us are welcome into the love of God, that all of us are part of the family of God, that each and every one of us bears the image of God. I want to invite you to reflect this morning, to settle in, to breathe deep of God's good spirit, to think about the things in your life from which you need deliverance, redemption this morning. Maybe it's that nagging voice that says you didn't do enough this week. Maybe it's that voice that wonders, should you really be here now? Maybe it's despair wondering when will this season finally yield. Breathe deep. I know that you are held in a loving embrace of God, made known to us in Jesus Christ and in this community of love, of justice, and of peace. Let us worship.
Good morning, young disciples and disciples of all ages. There's a Bible verse that begins with, for God so loved the world. I got to thinking about that verse and how great God's love is, and I wondered, how could we measure God's love? So I brought a bunch of measuring tools that I thought might help us. Sometimes when you cook, you need to measure things. And if I were baking cookies, I would use a measuring cup to help me use the exact amount of flour and sugar and chocolate chips I needed. I wonder if this measuring cup can help us. The Psalms say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes my cup to run over. Well, if our cup is running over with God's love, then this isn't gonna help us measure it. If I were to build something, I would need to measure height and width and length. So I thought maybe my tape measure might help. The Psalms say that God's love is higher than the heavens. Well, if God's love is higher than the heavens, then I don't think this is gonna measure it either. I also have a watch that measures time. And people measure all sorts of things by time. Some people this morning could even be measuring how long the pastor preaches with their watch. I wonder if we could measure how long God's love will last. The scriptures say in the Psalms that God's love lasts from everlasting to everlasting. Wow, that's like from forever to forever. And I don't think my watch could measure that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's an amazing amount of love, and I don't know how we could ever measure it. And I don't think we need to. I think we just need to experience it. So today, open your heart and open your eyes and look for God's love. Bless the Lord, my soul, and bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, who Bless the Lord my soul.
and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Perhaps that's the best prayer of confession we could offer. In this Lenten journey, we are honest with God. We're honest with our own souls about that which we need. And God is so full of grace and so rich in mercy. We know we can count on God to hear us and to be there with us. In the Ephesians scripture assigned to this week in the lectionary, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, assuring them of the richness of God's mercy and the immeasurable nature of God's grace. With all of that in mind, let us open our souls in confession. Let us pray. God, we come to you today grateful for your immeasurable grace and for your abundant love. We confess how tired our souls are of uncertainty and how afraid we can be of the future. And we confess we know you are the assurance we need. Thank you for this journey to Jerusalem with Jesus. Thank you for all the companions we have along the way. And thank you for the promise that will meet us there. In the silence that follows, please hear us as we open our souls to you with our personal prayers of confession. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us and grant us your peace. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from John's third chapter. We enter this passage and find Jesus and Nicodemus deep in conversation. Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, is very curious about Jesus' teaching. And so he finds Jesus in the night to ask him questions and to listen. Today we hear Jesus talk about the death that awaits him. To begin, Jesus puts forth a simile that references a story in the book of Numbers. This was a brilliant idea, for Nicodemus certainly would have been familiar with the story from the book of Numbers, and so he would easily pick up on the holy and spiritual nature of Jesus' death. Carrie Hughes will read today's passage from Numbers, and I will pick up right after Reading from John's Gospel. Listen for God's word spoken in Scripture. A reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit anyone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God's word for God's people. Let us pray. God of wisdom, may your spirit guide us as we enter into the mystery of your presence that lives within these ancient stories of Scripture. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Some animals get a bad rap. Wolves, for instance. There's the story of the three little pigs, Little Red Riding Hood, Peter and the wolf, and snakes and serpents, the Garden of Eden, and today's scripture passage about deadly snakes. Perhaps snakes get a bad rap because some are poisonous and very deadly. Perhaps it is because they slither instead of walk and move in unexpected ways. Perhaps, as anthropologist Lynn Isbell urges, it is because for millions of years, snakes were the only significant predators of primates, and this is embedded in our unconscious. Whatever the reason, there are a lot of people who are afraid of snakes. 60% of people questioned in a Harris poll on what are we most afraid of answered snakes. This suggests there is a good chance you too are frightened of snakes. In middle school youth group, I asked the question, if you were alone in the wilderness for a long time, what would be the first fear you would face? We pondered this question as we imagined the fears Jesus faced during the 40 days and nights he was alone in the wilderness. What topic do you think this question sparked? Snakes, snakes and bugs. Like the Harris Poll, there is a high percentage of middle school youth whose first fear is of snakes, or at least this was the first fear that came to mind. Our obscure passage this morning from the Torah tells of snakes slithering through the desert, biting and killing Israelites. In John's Gospel, Jesus brings to light this final murmuring, this final complaint of the Israelites while traveling with Moses and Aaron. The Israelites speak out against Moses and Aaron many times during their arduous 40-year journey in the desert. But this final complaint is different. This time, the people speak out against God, and their problems only get worse. In response to their complaints against God, God sends snakes among them. 
and many Israelites die from their poisonous venom. God's people quickly realize where this current problem began. So they go and they confess to Moses that they have sinned against God and against him. They ask Moses to pray to the Lord to take the serpents away. Moses prays on their behalf, and what happens next is most unusual. God doesn't take the snakes away in response to their repentance. God doesn't demand further repentance. Instead, God instructs Moses to make a poisonous serpent and to set it on a pole. And he tells Moses that those who are bitten will look up at that snake on the pole and live. Moses, being the faithful leader of this band of people traveling toward the promised land, and a faithful servant of God, does as God asks. He makes a serpent of bronze, and he puts it up on a pole. And he tells the people to look up at the snake after they are bitten, and they will live. What an odd and seemingly cruel way to offer life, to ask your people to look up at the very thing that is the cause of great pain and suffering. This story and image of a snake lifted up on a pole, given by God to heal and offer life, is the image Jesus puts forth to Nicodemus as he speaks of the lifting up of himself, of his own body on a pole, so that we too might be healed and have life, life everlasting. And Jesus said, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What an odd and seemingly cruel way to offer life. To ask your people to look up and see the very thing that is the cause of great pain and suffering, violence, and acts of great injustices, a man dying on a cross. I have wondered many times why the day Jesus died on the cross is called Good Friday. Have you ever wondered about this, too? What is good about such a violent and unjust act? I confess, for most of my Christian life, I have skipped right over the suffering of the cross to land in Easter, where joy lives. With a full heart, I easily join the Easter parade to celebrate the knowledge that life conquers death, I sing out with the trumpets in thanks for the gift of God's good news of new life, new life offered here and now and forevermore through Jesus' resurrection. I relish the empty cross. Perhaps you have also skipped right over Good Friday to Easter. It is easy to do in our Protestant church where there are no images of Jesus on the cross. No crucifix hanging on the wall to remind us of Jesus' suffering. In seminary, my worship professor, Matthew Meyer Bolton, challenged me in pointing out the importance and the deep meaning of the cross in our life as Christians. After our conversation, I knew I would need to wrestle with this part of our Christian story. But it was a while before this happened. That is, until my trip to Italy during my sabbatical in 2014. There is no escaping the image of Jesus on the cross in the land of the Roman Catholic Church. In every town around many corners are churches, and outside and inside these churches, Jesus hangs on the cross. This was my time to look up at the crucifix and confront my fears of the violence and the suffering I saw there, to open myself up to the brutality that is central to our Christian story. 
Italy provided me an invitation to encounter Good Friday. During the extended time we were in Italy, I raised my head and my eyes to look up at Jesus on the cross, but one particular crucifix opened my heart and healed my fear. I sat alone in the very small chapel at the Convent de Celle, situated in the rising hills behind the hill town of Cortona in Tuscany. This chapel is part of a convent that was built around St. Francis's meditation cell, where he retreated to pray in solitude. The chapel entrance sits on one side of the large convent. I entered the chapel, and for some reason, my husband Dave did not follow me in. Inside the chapel, the ceiling was low. There were maybe seven rows of short pews split down the middle by a center aisle. The aisle led to the front of the chapel where a large crucifix hung. I sat and became lost in this image of Jesus on the cross. Something about him in that moment seemed so real and so approachable. I was deeply drawn in as, is, as if in meditation. It was then I heard within my mind and soul the words, I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. These words permeated my body and mind. They appeared as though Jesus was the one saying, I knew what I was doing. Then love filled my heart and tears of gratitude spilled over while I sat in the stillness of the chapel. These words and the love I felt became the essence of my encounter with Jesus on the cross. In those moments with Jesus, I was freed of my fear to witness his suffering and in its place, love came tumbling in, a love that drew me closer to face his suffering, to face human suffering in the world, suffering in my family, in friends, in you, and in myself. I looked long enough at Jesus to encounter and receive the love he offers me and you and all of us right in the middle of our human suffering. Looking up at the suffering of Jesus on the cross, my fear dissipated, and I was touched by a great love. Looking up at the bronze snake on a pole after being bitten by a poisonous snake, healed and offered new life to the Israelites. In delving into scripture this morning, it seems important to God that we look at what is hard for us to see. Why is that? Perhaps it is because when we look at what we are afraid of long enough, our vision moves beyond our fear, where we encounter God's presence and are healed by God's abundant love. It surely wasn't the bronze snake on a pole that gave life to the suffering Israelites. It was God. And looking up at Jesus on the cross, we see the amazing love and power of a God who travels with us through the suffering of life and ushers us into the light of new life evermore. God so loved the world, he asks us to see it all, every bit of it, so that we might see as God sees. We continue to walk together on our Lenten journey to Jerusalem, and we know what awaits us there. Jesus will die a horrible death on a cross. When we arrive at the cross, look up and see him there. Bring your sins and your fears to this place. Our gracious God will transform them all into saving grace. God so loves the world. 
God so loves you. Amen. Such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a Brothers and sisters in Christ, will you join me in prayer? O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for spring, for new beginnings, and for new life. As the days are getting longer and brighter, we are filled with your loving warmth and a renewed sense of hope and healing. Each year at this time, we marvel at your creation. In the first buds of spring, the thawing of ice and snow, and new life growing beneath it. The return of creatures big and small from winter retreats and slumbers. This year, more than ever, we crave that sense of hope and renewal the blessed light at the end of a very long and dark tunnel. God, you are the source of that light that shines our way. This past year has tested our faith to the very core. We witnessed unthinkable losses. Over half a million of our brothers and sisters in the U.S and countless more across the world. We saw many acts of injustice testing the human spirit. We continue to mourn for all that was lost this past year. Our loved ones, our sense of safety, connections with others, financial security, celebrations of milestones, and even warm hugs. In the midst of all of this sadness, there is still so much to be thankful for. We are grateful for scientists and healthcare workers and first responders and volunteers for making vaccines a reality so quickly for so many. We are grateful for living in an area of the world with access to good medicine and healthcare and the privilege of getting these vaccines. We are grateful for our teachers and school staff 
who risk their health and well-being every day to keep our children in school. We are grateful for grocery store workers and farmers and UPS drivers and everyone in between who helped us keep food on the table and even presents under the Christmas tree. And we are grateful for technology that helped to keep us connected during a time when connection was needed more than ever. God, we ask that you guide us during this Lenten season. When we feel despair, heavy with grief and loss, feeling hopeless about the tragedies in our midst, feeling powerless to the inequities and injustices in our world. Open our hearts to all that is good and kind and loving. Open our eyes so that we may see all the small acts of kindness that happen every day, but we are too close to notice them. The smile from a stranger, the help from a neighbor, a supportive text from a friend, the feel of a child's small hand in your own, a warm dog on your lap. Open our ears so that we may recognize when someone is suffering and guide us to respond with compassion and understanding. God, we ask that you give us the courage and wisdom to follow your teachings so that we may light the way for others towards a more peaceful and just world. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi friends, thank you for joining us for this virtual worship service. Although we are not gathered in person for worship, we trust that whenever two or more of us are gathered in spirit, are gathered virtually, that Christ is with us. That trust has carried us through this past year. Today is a bittersweet Sunday, as today marks one year of virtual worship services at Village Church. Last year on this Sunday, we live streamed a service right here in this chapel. It was the first ever live streamed and the first ever virtual service at Village Church. The next Sunday, we moved to a pre recorded format. And since then, we have put together 58 online services weaving our way through Lent and Holy Week, Easter and Pentecost, summer worship, ordinary time, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, and back to Lent again. We've had Youth Sunday and Residency Sunday and Welcome Sunday and Confirmation Sunday and Thanksgiving Sunday. 
We've collaborated with the Congregational Church of Weston, the Spirit of Life Catholic Community, and our sister congregation, the historic Charles Street AME Church. We've tried Facebook Live and YouTube Premiere and Zoom services. If you remember back to this time last year, we thought this social distancing stuff was going to last for two weeks. Who could have known that it would run over a year? This is a bittersweet Sunday. It's bitter because there has been and continues to be so much sacrifice and so much loss. We miss seeing each other in person. We miss being in our sanctuary and chapel and village common and youth room together. We miss hugs and handshakes and singing and sharing bread and cup. And it's sweet because of you and because of your faithfulness, because you continue to show up or log on. You continue to offer your presence and your participation and your prayers. You continue to offer your gifts, financial gifts that are needed to keep our church vibrant and thriving, and gifts of time and passion and talent. Over the past year, you have joined us in learning new ways, in reimagining being church, and in upping our technology games. So thank you, Village Church. Thank you for being you. As winter thaws and we start to enjoy longer days, there is much to inspire thanks and much to inspire hope. The pastoral staff are brainstorming ways that we can safely gather together in person during Holy Week. We're dreaming of palm parades and Easter sunrise services and egg hunts. Stay tuned for more information as we get closer. In the meantime, please know that your pastoral staff is here for you. You can reach out to any of us at any time, and we will be glad to connect with you. Or you can join us for 30 Good Minutes on Wednesdays at 10 a.m., 7 p.m., or 8.30 p.m. If you haven't had the chance to join us for one yet, there are still two weeks left of 30 Good Minutes. So come. Come for some prayerful meditation and contemplation that is like food for the soul. Also happening this week, Diane will be hosting Senior Connect on Tuesday at 2 p.m. on Zoom. But before all that, you are welcome to join us for coffee hour on Zoom immediately following this worship premiere. Our moderator, Cynthia Sibold, will be hosting a moderator's musing during coffee hour. So you are welcome to come with your questions or ideas or thoughts. Let's pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the beloved community we know as Village Church and the ways your spirit moves among us and draws us together. And we dedicate to you all our gifts that you may use them as you use us to be beacons of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your abiding love for all the world to know and receive. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
A blessing from the book of Numbers. May God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.